Nowhere was the division sharper or more painfully drawn than on the campus of Kent State University, where, on a spring day in 1970, yet another protest was held. The difference this time, National Guardsmen with weapons loaded. Tempers flare, shots are fired, four students are killed. During that period, TV5 sent reporter Roger Sims and the late photographer Jeff Lentz to Vietnam to interview servicemen from Greater Cleveland. All the while, Cleveland and Ohio were playing a vital role in the building of the future. John Glenn awed us all in 1962 when he became the first American to orbit the Earth aboard Friendship 7. Another Ohioan, Neil Armstrong, was the first man on the moon. On a far smaller scale, a Clevelander named Bob Manry set out on another odyssey, crossing the Atlantic in a 13-foot boat. We here at TV5 tracked his trip, too. Some of the other bits of history you've witnessed through the years and eyes of TV5, the story of Dr. Sam Shepard of Bay Village, accused of murdering his wife in 1954. The dreadful winter of 1977 and 78, the snow seemed to swallow everything. In city and suburb, life slowed to a crawl. And then there was the decline and fall first of the Cleveland News, then of the Cleveland Press, the last a blow from which the city still hasn't recovered. Change. That's what we've chronicled over the years. This was Cleveland's skyline 35 years ago. Nothing about this city has changed more. Most recently, the old Cuyahoga and Williamson buildings fell, the past making way for the future. The future on this corner to be the new Ohio Center, as striking a symbol of the city's tomorrows as any you might imagine. Change. There will be more. We'll be here to tell you about it as it occurs and to recall it again, we hope, 35 years from now. That's good, Pat. You jogged a lot of memories with that. <laughs> we only we only skimmed the surface, too, Fred. Uh, those are just a few of the stories that TV5 has covered over the years. You know, those were some of the serious stories. There were also a lot of lighter stories that we tried to look back at with you along the way. Eyewitness newsreel has ah, covered yes, a lot of them over the years, haven't we? More than 7,000 of them, as a matter of fact. And the Eyewitness Newsreel even has a little bit of touch of class because it's an Emmy Award winner. That's right. Newsreel, you know, provided laughs over the years, but those have been by design. Chuckles by our own mistakes, however, are under no control of our own, <laughs> as you might see. You believe it. Elite is selling your prized gold and silver possessions. Well, before you accept any offers, you might want to listen to a three-part report. But Marge Banks begins tonight. I think that's pretty good advice. You don't have to stop using them entirely. Just use them, not use them, just not use them all the time. It's amazing how the Browns have recaptured the sports fans of this area. Uh, they, it's a good disappearing act. One year I vote Republican, the next year I vote Democrat. I'm, um, what is it, not bisexual, but what is it? <laughs> I don't think that's the word you wanted. So uh, let's check our satellite first of all and find out what has been happening. And uh, well, there's a strange picture and all kinds of strange pictures. Leisure suits. <laughs> Leisure suits. Leisure suits. I can't even say it. How can I read the story? <laughs> oh, moments oh. like that is when they happen, you drive home and think, oh my, did that really happen? But they well, do. Well, we have a lot of fun, but, you know, we take a little bit of our work seriously, like, uh, We'll take a look at 35 years of TV newscasters. <laughs> All right. How's that, huh? The list of people who cover the news for TV5 is about as long as Euclid Avenue itself. Back in the beginning, doing the news was no big deal. The staff announcer usually read the headlines. But as television grew and the technology improved, so did our news coverage. The nightly news became a fixture in the program schedule. And, of course, Dorothy Fulheim was there, too, or just as she is now. A lot of people sat in that anchor chair over the years. John B. Hughes, Joel Daly, Ron Penfound, known as Captain Penny later. His co-anchor was Paul Wilcox, who now hosts TV5's Polka Varieties. Jack Perkins was our news director in the 50s. He later went on to start him at NBC. And here's Tom Field, and Dave Buckle, and Fred DeBrine, all mainstays of the 60s. And here's another Fred, Fred Griffith, who, believe it or not, also used to be the news director. After that, he went on to host some obscure talk show. Never heard from him again. And then in 1969, a young man with bushy sideburns and a furrowed brow came to TV5. John Hambrick. 
Shortly afterward, TV5 Eyewitness News was born, launching one of the most successful local news programs in America. The torch was passed in 1975 to Dave Patterson and the guy who's still here today, Ted Henry. 35 years after that five-minute newscast, TV5 airs more than two and a half hours of news every day with state-of-the-art technology and a staff of dedicated professionals. That already long list growing nearly every day. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take a look at sports over the years and Dorothy Fulltime. Cleveland sports, especially some exciting championships. Thank you. Uh, I've been here 16 <laughs> years with Channel 5, and few as exciting as 1948. This is Red Barber and Van Patrick broadcasting live. TV5 taught the world about sports coverage back then by televising the first World Series. And the flamboyant Bill Veck, the Indians owner and master promoter, began his own show here. A 35-year synopsis for Cleveland sports has to start with the Cleveland Indians at the top of the baseball world as world champions in 1948, led by Lou Boudreau, Bob Feller, Bob Lemon, Joe Gordon, Larry Doby, and Gene Bearden. Their last glory year was 1954, when they were toppled in four straight World Series games by the New York Giants. They never recovered. The Cleveland Browns won the championship in their four years in the All-America Conference, and the orange and brown tidal wave continued in the NFL with world championships in 1950, 54, and 64. The heroes were Hall of Famers Otto Graham, Marion Motley, Bill Willis, Lenny Ford, Jim Brown, Danny Lavelli, Lou Groza, and their founder and coach Paul Brown. His world collapsed in January of 1963 when he was fired. NBA basketball came to Cleveland when the Cavaliers were formed in 1970. The miracle of Richfield was the high point under owner Nick Maletti and coach Bill Fitch. They eliminated Washington in the first round of the playoffs and broke NBA attendance records only to lose to the Boston Celtics. They too never came back. The Cavaliers played in their new home, the 21,000 seat Coliseum starting in 1974. It was another dream of Nick Maletti who vowed to leave his footprints in the sand. Hockey had its love affair with Cleveland as the old Barons in the American Hockey League. Home was the Cleveland Arena, Euclid and East 36th Street. Fred Glover was the star of the 50s and 60s. The Crusaders had a short life in the World Hockey Association, itself only a promoter's passing fancy. Then came two years as the Barons again were in the National Hockey League. Now hockey is only another Cleveland memory. Well, at least sports history is fun. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for doing that for us. It's nice to look back once again. We are talking about going back. We're going to go back right now to Fred Griffith. And we're going to introduce you to the one and only. Hey. May I have a kick? She's what you've been waiting for. Dorothy, you changed since I saw you a little bit ago. How fabulous. I have a new dress on. It's just for this special it's occasion. The most expensive I've ever worn. Dorothy, what did you wear when you first did your first program on WEWS? Can you remember? Oh, heavens no. The first time um, Mr. Henry Henry saw me, had a great big hat, and I was carrying a parasol. Mm -hmm. That's why he gave me the job. Well, did he look at your educational and uh, academic and uh, journalistic credentials at that time, or he just liked no. the hat? <laughs> <laughs> he just liked the hat. Well, w would you say it was just kind of uh, just luck? Well, no, not really. I had uh, attacked the president because the um, Brotherhood of Trail Trainmen had had a strike, and he was using the army, and I objected to Truman doing it. And so the trainman asked me to do a network yes. editorial, and he had heard it, and that was why. And that was carried on the full network? Yes. And so, so Mr. Hanrahan rang you up. You were in the phone book in those times. I don't really know how it happened, mm -hmm. but I went in there determined to charm him. Mm -hmm. Took me about five minutes. Usually he does about three minutes, mm -hmm. but, you know. But he was tough, huh? He was, yeah, he was, he was, a, he he was a stern Irishman, right? Oh, uh, he was a very original guy. Yes. I had some extraordinary experiences with him. And, and the things that you did in those days on this station were the first that they were done any place. 